grade school, we learn about integers, rational numbers, and irrational numbers. Integers are straightforward. We use them to count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Rational numbers are just ratios of integers, so that's a piece of cake. We can actually express them as two vectors of integers, where we say that two are equivalent if we can get from one to the other by either multiplying both or dividing both by the same integer. What about irrational numbers? There are apocryphal stories that say that the first person to discover an irrational number was put to death by the Pythagoreans because he violated their religious beliefs that everything can be expressed as either an integer or a ratio of integers. This Hippasus of Metapontum was trying to answer the simplest question that you would have after discovering the Pythagorean theorem. What is the length of the diagonal of a unit cube? It turns out that the square root of 2 was the right answer mathematically, but the wrong answer for Hippasus. Expressing an irrational number takes looking at the decimal expansion of a number. These should be infinitely long, and they shouldn't have any sort of periodicity in their decimal expansion. But all of these numbers can be written in a decimal expansion. The integer 1 is straightforward, you just slap a bunch of zeros at the end. 1 half is 0 0.5 with a bunch of zeros. 1 third is 0 0.3 repeating. Pi, we know, is 3.14159, etc. But saying that a number is determined by its decimal expansion isn't really the whole story. We have all seen that weird phenomenon where if we take 0 0.9 repeating, call it x, and then multiply x by 10, subtract by x, or 0 0.999, then on the right we get 9, and on the left we get 9x. So what this tells us is that x must have been 1 this whole time. But we already have a decimal expansion for 1. It's 1 with a bunch of zeros after the decimal. We know that Archimedes did a lot of work with pi, and at the time, the Hindu Arabic number system wasn't invented yet. He didn't write down pi is 3.1415, he started with 22 over 7, and then he came up with the routine to generate new rational approximations of pi. So then, the question is, is the decimal really the whole story of real numbers? And, well, what are they exactly? If you feel this is strange, then you are not alone. To determine a definition of the real numbers that makes this whole 0.9 repeating equals 1 clear, we are going to dive directly into research mathematics of the mid-19th century. In fact, two of the big figures of the time developed an answer to this question in the same year. Dedekind and Cantor had two distinct but equivalent definitions of real numbers. Dedekind developed what he called Dedekind cuts, and Cantor decided to take collections of sequences of rational numbers that look like they should converge, but might not actually converge. This would be like taking Archimedes' sequence of approximations of pi and just declaring that to be pi. And we call these sequences Cauchy sequences. These definitions by Cantor and Dedekind are equivalent in that they both produce a totally ordered field with the least upper bound property, which uniquely characterizes the real numbers. So once you come up with a number system and it has these properties, you know you found the real numbers. We are going to go into Cantor's approach because this approach introduces us to a lot of important concepts for metric spaces and real analysis in general. We just start by saying that each sequence isn't going to be a distinct real number. There might be a lot of ways to approximate the same number, so we also need to define what it means for two different sequences that correspond to the same number. And this is going to give us what we call an equivalence class. Let's take a look at pi for an example. Okay, we know that we can write a decimal expansion for pi as 3.14159, etc. The way that we're going to represent pi is we're going to take a look at different ways of approximating pi and making sequences of these different approaches and then putting them all together and we'll call that overall collection, this equivalence class, pi. For instance, we could just write out the decimal expansion one at a time and each one of these terms is going to be a rational number. So we can start with 3 then 3.1, and then 3.141, and then 5, 9, etc. And we can do it another way. We can start with just say all zeros, and just let each one of the coefficients appear one at a time, like popcorn. So we can have a 1 pop over here, a 4 pop over here, a 5, a 3, another 1, a 9, etc. And that would be another sequence that would get us to pi. Notice that both of these are actually increasing the pi, but we don't have to we can actually decrease to pi. We can start with 3.2 as our initial point in the sequence, and then drop down. So we can say do 3.15, and then 3.146, etc. Eventually, 
if this sequence is actually converging to pi, we should eventually see everything turn into 3.14159, etc. And these sequences might be determined just like what I'm telling you now. Uh, they could come from, say, the Leibniz series for pi, which comes from the formula from arctangent. It could also come from Ramanujan's series for pi, or it could come from the way that Archimedes came up with his approximations, which come from approximating areas of circles. Each one of these sequences is a sequence that tends to pi. That means that pairwise difference between any two of these sequences should be going to zero. And then we say that if that happens, then two sequences are equivalent. And since all of these sequences are going to be equivalent, we call this an equivalence class. And this equivalence class, we put the label pi. And so this is our number pi. All right, so now let's go ahead and talk about more than just pi and general real numbers. And for this, we're going to need to consider all equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences of rational numbers. Okay, if you like what I've been doing so far, please take a moment to like the video and that'll tell YouTube that people like it and want to watch it. And these videos, they take a lot of work. And so I'd really like to hear your feedback and let me know what you think worked and what didn't work. But let's go ahead and get back to the first take. Let's consider the sequence of rational numbers. We'll denote it by, say, qn, where n ranges from 1 to infinity. We say that qn goes to 0 if for any positive rational number epsilon, there is an integer capital N such that for all little n larger than a capital N, the absolute value of qn is less than epsilon. Another way to think about it is if we have any small neighborhood about 0, then a sequence that is going to 0 can only fool around outside that neighborhood for a finite amount of time. And from then on, it is always inside that small neighborhood. Since we can make this neighborhood as small as we like, we can force the sequence to get as close to zero as we like after some finite amount of time. Hence, that sequence converges to zero. For example, let's say we have that sequence 0 0.9, 0 0.99, 0 0.999, etc. We can show that the difference between this sequence and one goes to zero. The difference between one and each member of this 0.9 sequence is just what you expect, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001, etc. The proof we are about to go through is really common in real analysis, and generally how you start almost every proof in your introductory real analysis course is by declaring an epsilon is greater than zero. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to take some quantity and we want to squeeze it underneath epsilon, and in doing so we're actually going to show that the sequence is converging to zero. Now suppose we are given some rational number epsilon. Since epsilon is rational, we can write it as a over b for some, say, a that is a positive integer that is at least 1. Note that 1 over b is less than or equal to epsilon. Our sequence, then, is 10 to the minus n. And we know that for whatever b we choose, there's going to be some n where a power of 10 is bigger than b. And once we know 10 to the big n is bigger than b, we know that 10 to the little n is bigger than b for all little n bigger than big n. Hence, we know if we look at 1 over 10 to the little n, this is going to be smaller than 1 over 10 to the big n, which itself is smaller than 1 over b, which itself is less than epsilon. And this holds for all little n bigger than big n. Since epsilon is arbitrary. That means that there was nothing special about the selection that depends on big N. We have demonstrated that this sequence converges to zero. Now, this isn't a long proof, but let's go ahead and chunk it anyway. That first bit with the epsilon is something that we are almost always going to invoke in real analysis proofs. When we set some sort of epsilon, the goal is to get some quantity underneath it. We express epsilon as a ratio just because it's easy to get something that will be bigger than the denominator b. And keep in mind, this isn't the only way to do this. Then we invoked a form of the Archimedean property, where we knew that we can get a power of 10 to be bigger than b. And once we have that, we knew that flipping this would get us underneath 1 over b. Then the rest was just matching our new definition. And once we did that, well, we know we we're done. That's what the goal was, to show that this difference between 1 and 0.999 goes to zero. So now what we need to talk about is what a Cauchy sequence is. Now a Cauchy sequence is a sequence that should morally be converging, but might not literally converge. This would be like something like the sequence of rational numbers that should be approximating pi. Since pi isn't a rational number, that means that we can't be converging in the set of rational numbers to pi. 
because it's sort of outside that set. And so the whole point to the real numbers is to sort of fill in these holes. And we use Cauchy sequences to do that. Now, a Cauchy sequence is defined in a very similar way to conversion sequences. Let's take a generic sequence of rational numbers. We say that this sequence is a Cauchy sequence if for every positive rational number epsilon, there is a positive integer n such that for all little n and little m bigger than n, we have that the difference between qn and qm is gonna be less than epsilon. Notice how close this is to the R convergence definition. Indeed, any convergence sequence is a Cauchy sequence. This actually follows from using the triangle inequality, but we'll talk about that a little bit more in the future. The significant difference here is that we don't know if this is a convergence sequence from the outset. So here's our definition of a real number. A real number is a collection of Cauchy sequences for which if you take the difference between any pair of sequences, that difference will converge to zero. This is what we call an equivalence relation. Those two sequences we say are equivalent. And if you take a collection of all Cauchy sequences that are equivalent in this way, then this is called an equivalence class. So pi isn't simply 3.14159, etc. in this framework. It is a collection of all sequences of rational numbers that say converge to pi. Also, we can see that the rational numbers are in the reals, or at least we can find a one-to-one -one correspondence between the rational numbers and some particular real numbers. In particular, given a rational number q, we can take the equivalence class that contains at least one constant sequence of our rational number, and that quote real number can be said to correspond to the rational number q. Okay, so we have some vague idea of what real numbers are now. They are equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences of rational numbers. But to satisfy the real number axioms, we need to have a totally ordered field with the least upper bound property. Demonstrating that the reals are actually a field is relatively straightforward. I mean, addition and multiplication come from adding and multiplying members of these sequences and then making a new sequence out of these sums of products, which if it is a Cauchy sequence, and it is a Cauchy sequence, then it is in a potentially different equivalence class. Other things that need to be verified is the existence of an added identity, so a zero, a multiplicative identity, which would be a one, and finally, the existence of additive and multiplicative inverses, which means we need to have negatives and also reciprocals. We need to show that this is all, quote, well-defined, and that means that if we take two equivalence classes that are real numbers, select a Cauchy sequence arbitrarily from each and add or multiply them together, then we will always get a Cauchy sequence that is in the same equivalence class. We will show this for addition here. And later on, I think I might do a live stream maybe a week or so from now, and we can go through and hash out even more details. But first, we need to acknowledge the elephant in the room. We need the triangle inequality. In short, if we look at the absolute value of the sum of two rational numbers, then this is smaller than the sum of the absolute values of the individual terms. The name itself comes from the idea that for a triangle, the sum of the lengths of any two sides is bigger than the length of the third side. So now let's go ahead and start proving what we want. We're gonna start by proving that the sum of any two Cauchy sequences gives us another Cauchy sequence. So if we let epsilon be a positive rational number, then for each sequence, there is an n and m for which given any n1 and n2 greater than capital N and m1 and m2 greater than capital M, we have that the difference between pn1 minus pn2 is less than epsilon over two and qm1 minus qm2 is also gonna be less than epsilon over two. Now, note the epsilon over two. This isn't completely necessary, but it'll give us a nice polished result at the end. The difference is that we would end up with, say, a 2 epsilon at the end of all of this, rather than just an epsilon. And that's just a constant scaling of a really small quantity, so it's still pretty small. So we don't have to worry too much. Now, we'll assume that m is actually bigger than n. And if it isn't, then the argument goes the same way just by swapping the roles. And we usually say, without loss of generality, assume that m is bigger than n or something like that. Now let's take a look at the sequence that comes from the sum of these two sequences. And let's assume that little n and little m are larger than capital M. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to show this as a Cauchy sequence. So we're going to take the difference between uh, the individual terms and look at the absolute value. So we're gonna have pn plus qn minus pm plus qm. We don't know much about the sum sequence itself, but we do know something about the p terms and the q terms. 
Let's go ahead and group them together like this. We haven't changed anything yet, but now the triangle inequality gives us this. And the last two terms on the right hand side of that inequality are bounded by epsilon over two because, well, we chose m to give us that. Then we get that this quantity is less than epsilon. Thus, the sum of two Cauchy sequences must be a Cauchy sequence because this fits that definition. Now, let's do our chunking here one more time. We wanted to show that the sum of any two Cauchy sequences was a Cauchy sequence. We needed to show that this new Cauchy sequence fit the definition, which meant that we need to start with an epsilon. And then we need to find that capital N, or in this case, it was a capital M. To find that M, we use the fact that the two individual Cauchy sequences fit the definition. And from each, we selected an N and an M, respectively. Now, we did this to fit underneath not epsilon, but epsilon over two. That's just because we knew we were gonna use the triangle inequality later on to recombine them. And after this, we took the larger of n and m, and we finished up everything with that triangle inequality. Now, I'm practically repeating myself here because the chunks are pretty small, but I'll try to keep this chunking going through the rest of the series when the things get a lot more complicated. Now, to finish the well-definedness, what you need to do is you need to take two different Cauchy sequences out of each different equivalence classes and recombine them. We want to show that each of the two sums ends up in the same equivalence class at the end of the day. Now, if they didn't, we would be able to take the same two real numbers and add them to get two different results. Now, this would be really bad, but don't worry, it doesn't happen. I'm not gonna go through all the details for this one, uh, but it works out almost identically to the argument that we just went through. So take this as sort of an exercise. Now we have real numbers and we know arithmetic works on them and they are a field. But now what about inequalities? We have nice inequalities for rational numbers. For instance, a over b is less than c over d if a times d is less than b times c. That's easy enough. But now we have these equivalence classes of sequences. Equality, we have established. Two real numbers are equal if when you take a representative Cauchy sequence from each, the difference of these two sequences goes to zero. Done. Now we say that if we take two real numbers that are not equal, one is larger than the other, if we can take a Cauchy sequence from each, and there's an integer capital N for which P sub N is bigger than Q sub N for all N greater than capital N. That is, there must be tails of our sequences where all of the rational numbers in that one tail are strictly larger than all of the rational numbers in the other tail. And that is all there is to it. All right, so now this brings us to the defining property of the real numbers, the least upper bound property. And when we learn about metric spaces, this will be seen as being equivalent to the completeness of the real numbers. So I want to tell you all about the least upper bound property, but this video is already too long. And so I'm going to kick the least upper bound property up the road and put it in this video here when it's done. Now, until next time, I hope you have a great day.